I hope everybody is doing well and enjoying this nice weather that we're having. All right. So many people coming in. So I'll say it a few times because we have some, some new folks. We're going to get everybody on mute this evening because we're going to be recording um, our webinar so that we can use this with other athletes at different times. So um, everybody's going to stay on mute. Um, we have some games to play in polls. So make sure you, uh, you're ready to play some games, some trivia questions. And uh, we'll get started in about two minutes. see so many athletes on our call tonight. I appreciate everybody taking the time to uh, learn about our return to return to activities uh, portion and more keep coming in. This is fantastic. All right, it is seven o'clock on the dot. So out of respect for everybody's time, uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, like I said, I appreciate everybody taking some time uh, to join us this evening to talk about um, our return to activities. And um, we'll do some quick introductions of our presenters. Um, I'm Jeff Abel, I'm Vice President of Local Programs at Special Olympics Maryland and have been working on um, Return to, return to activity since we stopped activity back in March. Uh, so I'm excited that we are, we are getting close uh, to having some in-person activities again. Um, and I'm happy to see so many familiar faces from our virtual movement programs. And Adam, you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi guys, for those of you uh, who don't know me, my name's Adam Hayes. I'm a Special Olympic Maryland athlete from Frederick County. Uh, and I compete in cycling, soccer, basketball, alpine skiing, and swimming, uh, just to name a few, so. Just to name a few, cool, thanks Adam. Um, and Justin Hunsinger, do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, my name's Justin Hunsinger. I'm from Montgomery County. I play basketball, soccer, and softball. Awesome, thanks Justin. And I wanna, before we get started, I wanna thank Justin and Adam for their leadership for two of our um, athlete leaders who are serving on our return to play committee um, who have been representing um, you know athletes across the state in uh, what we're putting together to get athletes uh, safely back on the playing field. So uh, moving to our first slide, Adam, take it away. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, so uh, on tonight's webinar, uh, we will be covering a few topics uh, that uh, will help us. As athletes uh, re uh, return to in-person programs safely. Uh, some of our goals for tonight are to understand how Special Fix Maryland will safely return to in-person activities, learn about uh, phase one and phase two uh, of our return to activities model, uh, get uh, comfortable with uh, the pre-screening process that uh, we'll need uh, to take place before each acti activity understands safe behaviors that uh, we are expected to follow at practice and play a and we'll get to play a trivia game uh, about uh, safe return to activity. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. Uh, Justin, take it away. Before we get into the details of the plan, there are a few things that are important to remember. First, each local program 
will start at a different time. Some might be sooner than others, but it will be based on factors, including the availability of coaches, volunteers, and facilities. Also, you may not see every sport that you're used to seeing. Each local program will decide which sports they can safely offer, so that may be different county to county. Finally, registration numbers may be lower than you're used to seeing because there are group size restrictions. We may not be able to have everyone who wants to participate, but we will try to safely accommodate as many athletes as we can within the rules. That's absolutely right. Thanks, Justin. Um, so the first thing I'm going to be talking about uh, tonight, I get the next slide, is about individuals who may be of higher risk for COVID-19. And this is really important because um, while we start to get back into in-person activities, we need to understand that some people may be more susceptible to getting COVID-19 than others. Um, and so this comes from the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, um, which uh, you know helps our country uh, stay safe and healthy. So some of those um, high-risk individuals may be people who are 65 years or older, um, people who live in a nursing home or long-term care facility, um, those with chronic lung disease or moderate to severe asthma, um, individuals with serious heart conditions, including heart failure, uh, coronary artery disease, and congenital heart disease, people who are immunocompromised, and that's a really, uh, that's, a, that's a big word for uh, people who might, uh, are more susceptible to catch illnesses, right? Their immune system is compromised. So that would be things like uh, people who are receiving cancer treatment, people who smoke, uh, people who have had bone marrow or organ transplant, other surgeries like that. Um, other factors might be people who have um, a body mass index of 40 and above. So people who are obese, uh, people with diabetes, um, chronic kidney disease, undergoing dialysis, liver disease, um, and brain and spinal cord disorders. So that's a lot. And those are a lot of conditions. But we think it's important to put that out in front of everybody so that people understand there are people who are at a higher risk for catching COVID-19. Um, now, for athletes and participants who fall into one or more of those categories, it does not mean that you can't participate in Special Olympics. It just means that you should think about whether it's safe to do so or not. So you should talk to your family, caretakers, and doctor about if it's a good idea to participate in Special Olympics Maryland activities in person, right? Because you could be at a higher risk. Um, and if you are at a higher risk, you need to remember that, you know, you could be putting yourself at risk, uh, uh, but you could also be putting your friends and family at risk. But again, it doesn't mean that you can't participate. We just want you to consider a little more if it's the right decision for you, all right? So that's our, those are our individuals who might be at higher risk. Now, when he was talking, talked about the phases of return to play. So just like um, our communities, when they're coming back in phases, Special Olympics is gonna come back in phases too so that we can keep everybody as safe as possible. Like Adam said, every county is gonna do this differently. Every county is gonna start at a different time and every county is gonna have different sports at the different times. So Adam, those are really good points to start out with that not every county is gonna have everything that you're used to seeing right away. Right now, we're in that gray phase, phase zero, which means no in-person activity. That's what we're doing now. So we have our virtual movement, I see a lot of familiar faces from our Saturday night dances. Raise your hand if you've been on a Saturday night dance. Yeah, that's a lot of hands. Those are really popular. Our Friday uh, uh, fitness classes that athletes like David Godoy have led, um, Sam Livingston has led one. Um, so lots of, lots of great athlete leaders in our phase zero. Starting July 1st, programs can start to enter phase one, which means in-person activities may resume. But as Adam said, they're gonna look a little different than they have before. In phase one, groups need to be 10 people or less. And when we say 10 people or less, that's 
athletes, coaches, volunteers, and our unified teammates, right? So groups of 10 or less. Then the other part of phase one is that there can be no direct or indirect contact, which Justin is going to talk about um, in our next two slides, I think. Uh, maybe one more slide after that. Um, and then there's going to be a pre-screening that we cover later. So those are the three parts of phase one, that there's groups of, of 10 or less, not be direct or indirect contact, and that pre-screening is required to make sure everyone um, is safe and healthy and can be on site. Now in phase two, if things go well and our communities continue to be safe, some programs uh, will be able to move in phase two. And that means more, you know, in-person activities can continue and we can have bigger groups. So rather than groups of 10 or less, we can have groups of 50 or less. So we can have the other change is that we can have no direct contact, but we can have indirect contact. So Justin's going to talk about it, but direct contact being like, we won't be able to high five or fist bump or anything like that. But with indirect contact, that would be things like playing catch with a ball um, and catching and using equipment that hasn't been um, sanitized first. So in phase two, we can have indirect contact. But in phase two, the pre-screening that we'll talk about is still required. Now, down the road, um, we might get to phase three. Um, and in phase three, we can have in-person activities, but there's no restrictions on size and there, of the group, and there's no restrictions on direct or indirect contact. We can have direct and indirect contact, and there's no pre-screening required, okay? So one important thing to remember is that there is no timeline for when we move from one phase to the other. We might be in phase one for one month, we might be in phase two for three months. It's just all dependent on what is going to be safe for your community and your program. At the bottom of the, of the slide, you'll see a big blue line that, that has arrows going both ways, right? So that means, hopefully, we can continue to move from phase zero to one to two to three. But if people start catching COVID-19, uh, more rapidly, or the number of cases continues to increase, we might have to move backwards. So if we're in phase one, we might have to move back into phase zero. The whole idea is we want to keep athletes and volunteers as safe as we can. All right. So those are our phases. Phase one, phase zero, phase one, phase two, phase three. And we can go uh, slide one way or the other, depending on um, how safe our communities are. Okay. Cool. Um, Jeff, right. said that, Jeff, yep, said, cool. Jeff said that in phase one and phase two, direct contact is not allowed. Now we will learn what direct contact is. Direct contact is when two or more people touch each other in intentionally or unintentionally, like a high five or handshake are all examples of direct contact. Now we are going to play a game. Jeff is going to pull up a poll in Zoom. See if you can click on all of the options that are examples of direct contact. Cool. Thanks, Justin. So up on your screen, you see a poll. So there are three examples of direct contact on the list below. Can you pick which ones are direct contact? And after you pick them, hit the submit button. All right, let's give people 30 more seconds to make their choices. All right, so let's, I'm going to stop this and Justin, before we move on to the next one, let's talk through these. So. Um, 
the three correct answers for the three examples for direct contact were uh, giving a teammate a high five after scoring a goal in soccer. Definitely. And 32 of 37 votes said that was one. So great job. We found that one. The next one, shaking hands and saying good game with another athlete. Again, a handshake. We're hand to hand, right? So that's direct contact. Um, and the third one is hugging your coach after practice. That is also direct contact. The ones that are not direct contact are passing a football to your teammate or having an after practice snack after washing your hands. Those are tricky, uh, but they're not direct contact. So the three direct contact, again, are when we make intentional or unintentional touching with another person. Uh, so giving a teammate a high five, shaking hands, or hugging your coach after practice. So those are the three. Great job. You figured them out. That's really good. All right, Justin, let's move on to the next one. In phase one, there can be no direct or indirect contact, but in phase two, indirect, indirect contact is allowed. Indirect contact is when two or more people touch something, not another person that hasn't been cleaned or disinfected after someone else has touched that same object. If I pass Adam a football and he catches it, that's an example of indirect contact because the football wasn't cleaned between me throwing it and Adam catching it. Time for another game. On the poll that Jeff pulls up, see if you can click on all of the options that are examples of indirect contact. All right, here we go, indirect contact. So there are three examples of indirect contact listed below. Can you choose the items uh, that are indirect contact? All right, see if you can figure them out. All right, let's take 30 more seconds. This one's a little trickier. Oh, this one, is this only set to choose one? I might have set this up incorrectly. So we're gonna go ahead and talk through it. So there's three and I think I, I made that one harder than it had to be, uh, but, but it looks like people did choose one of the three that were correct. Sorry about that. Um, so indirect contact would be tossing the ball back and forth. It would also be picking up sports equipment after your teammate has used it if it hasn't been used. Um, and uh, helping a teammate lo load their bike after practice if it hasn't been cleaned. Um, and also, actually, there's four. Accidentally picking up someone else's water bottle uh, would be, so there's actually four examples of indirect contact. That was a, that was a tough one. Um, so again, indirect contact is um, equipment that hasn't been disinfected first. So disinfected meaning we use cleaner or sanitizer um, to make sure that that equipment is clean. Okay, so that's direct and indirect contact. Thanks, Jason. Um, so now I'm going to very quickly talk about new pre-practice screening that everybody is going to have to take before they come to an in-person event, all right? And there's two parts. There's a temperature screening and there are screening questions, okay? So when you show up to practice, someone will be taking your temperature with a touch-free thermometer, shooting it at your forehead. Um, I only have a forehead because I'm bald. Uh, but if you register, um, if your temperature registers 100.4 degrees or higher, um, that's, that does not pass, okay? Your temperature has to be 100.3 degrees or lower in order to be a pass. But if your temperature registers high once, we will take your temperature again after five minutes to give you a little time to cool down. Because sometimes, you know, based on, uh, Adam will talk about it, but based on what you do before practice, your temperature might be higher um, than it usually is. If it registers 100.4 or higher again, 
then you'll need to go home, okay? So if you have a fever uh, of 100.4 or higher, you cannot stay at practice and you have to go home. Um, the next part of the screening will be um, screening questions. And the answer to all of these questions, you have to be able to answer no to all of these questions. And the four questions are, have you been exposed to someone with COVID-19 in the past 14 days? Have you had a fever in the past week? Do you have a cough? And do you have any other symptoms of COVID-19 like chills, fatigue, and loss of taste or smell? So if you have to answer yes to any of those questions, you cannot stay at practice. So if you think you would want someone to help you answer those questions, like a staff member, a parent, or a family member, you can have someone at the screening with you before practice. That's absolutely fine. Um, but if you do answer yes to any of those questions or your temperature is too high, you have to go home, okay? Um, so I think, Adam, you have the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we are now going to talk about what to do before you come to an in-person activity, like, like a practice. First, pack your bag. We are going to need a few additional items uh, now. So uh, it's important to remember to bring them. First, everyone uh, should have a mask with them. And remember to wear, your, wear it when you're uh, not participating in uh, sport or activity. It, is also, it will also uh, be important to bring uh, some hand sanitizer with you to clean your, uh, clean your hands when you need to. Another important thing to bring is plenty of water. We won't uh, be able to have, uh, have large cooler, uh, water coolers uh, to fill up uh, a water bottle anymore. So make sure uh, you come with one or two bottles already filled. Now, you can uh, help me uh, pack my bag. On the Zoom poll uh, that will pop up, help me identify uh, items that would be important to bring uh, to a sports practice. All right, so pick, go ahead and pick some items that you think would be important to bring. All right, I see a lot of good answers. Take 10 more seconds. Nice. Looking good. Good job, everybody. All right, so let's share the results. So Adam, talk through these with me. Yeah, um, so, uh, so we had 100% of the people say a face mask. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Then it looks like uh, after that, uh, the ones uh, were uh, that people were uh, looking at were filling their water bottle, a filled water bottle, That's and a good hand one. sanitizer, which are absolutely. Really That's a good one. Hand masks, hand sanitizer, and a filled water bottle. Um, but there's some other good things there too, right? Like sunscreen, Adam. Is that something? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Gotta always uh, wear that sunscreen or bring us uh, some sunscreen for you when you're uh, out outside uh, playing and uh, especially a hat. So uh, th that was, those were really good uh, ones. Um, exactly. And yeah. if you're bald like me, you need a hat. Um, <laughs> and then what about, because we can't have indirect contact, Adam, don't, do we need to bring the proper sports equipment to use? Uh, uh, since, uh, since you want to uh, have uh, things that uh, you want to, uh, you don't want people to touch. Uh, don't you, uh, you uh, bring your own things. So exactly. So yeah. You don't have to, uh, so you're not sharing it. Uh, 
That is exactly right. You want to make sure that you have your own golf clubs or tennis rackets or, you know, kayaks and bikes. So that was really good. So, uh, Adam, do you want to keep moving? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, cool. So um, some some other important reminders are to use the uh, bathroom before leaving your home to come to practice. Also, think about uh, four questions in the uh, in, uh, in the screening uh, protocol. If you have to answer yes to any of those questions, do not come to practice. And if you don't feel well, again, stay home. Don't come to practice uh, straight from a workout. Exercising can increase your body temperature and may mean that you don't get to participate uh, that day. Most importantly, remember that practice uh, will look different uh, than it used to. There's uh, new screening measures and uh, we have to stay six feet away from our uh, teammates, but we're still going to have a lot of fun. That's awesome. I think so too. So Justin, take us, start us on our next slide. Oops, Justin, I muted you, hold on. Let me unmute you really fast. All right. Justin, I'm trying for you, man. I think Justin has to unmute himself. There we go. Justin, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's all good. Practice will still be fun, but here are some important reminders for practice. First, stay at least six feet from all other participants. Second, wear a mask at all times when at SMD activities. But it is optional while you're doing physical activity. And make sure you wash your hands or use hand sanitizer before practice starts to help keep everyone safe. It, uh, uh, and it will uh, be important to avoid touching your face during uh, practice to adjust your mask or wipe uh, sweat. If you need to, sanitize your hands first. It will uh, also be very important to not share uh, water bottles or towels with other people. Everyone needs to bring their own and uh, make uh, sure you're picking up uh, the right uh, bottle before you start drinking. Just like water bottles, it will be important for you to bring your own sports equipment, like golf clubs, tennis rackets, and bikes. It, it is safer uh, to use your own equipment, but if you need to, you should only share equipment if you are instructed to do so and if it is uh, first disinfected. That's right. Thanks, Adam. Um, all right, is everybody ready for some trivia? Because it is the lightning round. Oh, Sam, Sam Livingston just gave us a fist bump. He is ready to go. So I have a bunch of trivia questions ready for everybody um, about things that we learned in tonight's webinar. All right, so I'll pop them up one at a time and we'll talk about each one. So the first question, Let's bring that up. So the first question is, if you, if I, if you feel sick, um, what should you do? If you feel sick before practice, should you go to practice or stay home from practice? All right, we have 38 votes in. We're gonna end that. And Adam, give me the right answer. If you feel sick, should you come to practice or stay home? Stay home. That's right. 
Couldn't say it better myself. Stay home. Very good. If you feel sick, you want to make sure you're staying at home. All right, let's go to our next question. And this is one that, that Justin helped us learn. High-fiving a teammate is an example of indirect contact or direct contact. High-fiving a teammate. Thirty-eight votes in again, and eighty-seven percent say direct contact. Justin, is direct contact the right answer? What is high-fiving a teammate? Yes. All right. Way to go. Direct contact again. People touching intentionally or unintentionally, any physical touch is direct contact. Way to go. 34 of the 38 people got that one right. That's awesome. All right, let's go to the next question. Number three. How far do we need to stay away from other participants? Now, Adam just went over this one. How far do we need to stay away from other participants when we're at practice? One mile, six inches, six feet, one feet, one foot, one feet, <laughs> or 25 feet. All right, let's check it out. Adam, do you, do you remember the right answer? Six feet? Six feet, that's absolutely right. Now, I will get give a point to the person who said 25 feet because that's bigger than six feet. So 25 feet is, is as safe as six feet, so that's really good. Um, but we wanna make sure that we are six feet away or greater. Uh, so great job, everybody, on that one. All right, let's go to the next one. Let's see if I can stump some people uh, with this one. Oh, this one's a tricky one. In what phase can indirect contact start to happen? So in one of the phases, we couldn't have direct contact or indirect contact. And then in one phase, we could have no direct contact, but we could have indirect contact. So which phase can we have indirect contact first? Oh, I'm tricking some people. The pole's jumping from one to another. All right, 40 votes. And 25 people said the right answer. Adam or Adam or Justin, do you know what the right answer is? The uh, uh, to uh, start uh, in what phase can indirect contact? Uh, uh, indirect contact uh, can start in, uh, I'm sorry, in, uh, phase, phase uh, one. Phase two. Phase two, excuse me. But it's tricky because the first phase is actually phase zero. <laughs> yep, yep. That's right? So phase two is the right answer. So in phase one, we can't have direct or indirect contact. But in phase two, we can have indirect contact. And Adam, what's an example of indirect contact? Indirect contact is uh, giving someone a, a bat. Uh, yep. Or, That's it. Yeah. Handed someone their softball bat or yep. tossing them a football, right? Yep. Um, so that's indirect contact. And we can start doing that in phase two. So 25 people got that one. Absolutely right. Way to go. All right. Let's see if I can stump some more people on this next one. All right. Here's another good one. Is it a good idea to have a really hard workout before you go to practice? Yes because it helps warm up the body, or no, exercising can raise temperatures and may result in an inaccurate read when we take your temperature before practice. It's a good idea to have a really hard workout before practice. Man, those votes came in fast for that one. I don't think I'm tricking people on this one. All 
All right, 43. We had more people vote on that one. That's pretty good. That's great. All right. So Adam, is it a good idea to warm up, to have a really hard workout before you go to practice? No, because you don't want to raise your temperature. That's absolutely right. You can do some light stretching, right? It's always good to stretch and warm up before practice, but I wouldn't recommend, you know, going for a, look, don't get all 50 miles of your 50 for 50 right before practice. You want to slow it down, have some good dynamic stretches, a slow warm up. Uh, don't push it too hard because we don't want to elevate the temperature too much. So great job, everybody. 36 people saying no, don't have a hard workout, and 36 people are correct. All right, next one. All right. Should I share a water bottle with my teammate? No, definitely, or maybe, but only if I'm really thirsty. A lot of votes on this one. All right, all the votes are in. So Adam, you tell me before I share it. Should I share, should you and I, when you and I are playing tennis in Frederick, should we share a water bottle? No way. No, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> no way. No <laughs> way should we share a water bottle. Um, that's right, everybody should bring their own. And Adam, when we show up to practice, should we have, um, an empty water bottle that we can fill there or should we have water bottles that are already filled you want to have at least one or two water bottles with you that are already filled right that are already filled yep absolutely very cool um all right next one All right, when is it okay to share equipment with other participants? Is it number one, whenever we want, we're, on, we're all on the same team? Two, only when instructed to and after it has been properly disinfected, remember really cleaned and sanitized, or three, only when I forget my sports equipment? All right, vote's still coming in. Um, all right, 100% got this one right. That's really good. So yeah, it is okay to share, share equipment with other participants only when instructed to and after it has been properly disinfected. So everybody gets an air high five for that one. I thought, yes, there we go. Air high fives around the Zoom box. There we go. Only when it's been disinfected. 100% right. <laughs> really good. All right, last one. Let's see if we can get another 100%. True or false, my temperature will be taken before every in-person activity like a sports practice. All right, waiting for a few more. We'll end it there. Adam or Justin, will your temperature be taken before every in-person practice? Yes. That is correct. Um, before every practice. I see Leandra gave herself a fist pump. She got it right. Leandra, that's great. Way to go. All right, so I didn't, I didn't stump a lot of people. So that means, um, People are really paying attention and listen well. So uh, I want to thank everybody. We're breaking this up into three different webinars. Okay, so today was just general information. 
our next webinar that'll be in like two weeks will be about things to remember at practice. We'll talk more about indirect and direct contact, um, you know, and how we can stay safe during the actual practice. And then our third webinar will be about things to remember after practice, okay? So we don't wanna, there's a lot of information, a lot of phases, you know, a lot of new stuff. So we just wanted to start to introduce people. So the mo most important things I think to remember are, we are gonna slowly be able to start in-person practices very soon but your local program is going to determine what they can safely do when. So not every county will start at the same time. Not every county and program will have the sports that you are used to seeing, right? But the important thing is we're going to try and engage as many athletes as we can and keep everybody safe, all right? So if you have any questions, um, reach out to me, all right? You have my email because it sent the, the confirmation registration. So you can always email me with other questions and I will turn it to Adam and Justin to close us out tonight. We, we, hope, uh, we hope that uh, you learn uh, something new and uh, that you'll uh, join us for uh, the, uh, the next one uh, that we have. So thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah, great. Thanks, Adam. And, and Adam and Justin, great job. Uh, thanks for putting this together for our athletes. I think it was really good to start learning about some of the new um, procedures and stuff. Justin, do you want to say good night? Uh, th thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight, and have a great night. Yeah, definitely, and have a great 4th of July. Uh, yeah, happy holidays to everybody. And don't forget, I'm, I'm going to give people a heads up. You're going to get be the first ones to know. Our theme for this week this coming week for the 50-50, because it's 4th of July, is red, walk, and blue. So we want you to take a walk in your USA gear, your red, white, and blue, get out there um, and have a lot of fun. So thanks everybody for joining us. I am gonna unmute everybody so you can say good night to each other. I don't know if that's popular, so go ahead and say goodbye. Bye everybody, thank you. Good night, thank you. Thank you very much, bye. Bye everyone. Uh oh, um, yes. Thank you for coming, Adam everybody. Have a good weekend. 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 Bye, guys. Happy Fourth of July. 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 Bye. Love you guys. Bye. 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 Love you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 All right, I'm going to close it down. Thanks, everybody. If I can figure out where to put it. Bye. 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 B